Good afternoon. You're listening to 89.7 NPR News. I'm Claire Roth. Pedro Hernandez Ramirez has cared for his stepson Juan, who has cerebral palsy, for 14 years in Illyria. But that changes today. He was scheduled to fly out of Cleveland Hopkins Airport to Mexico at 1.30 this afternoon. Hernandez Ramirez entered the country illegally years ago, and though he's been deported before, he was granted permission to stay in 2015, partially because of his caregiver role. His wife, Celeste Wanowski, says the deportation leaves their family with few options. Welcome to Entry Denied, a podcast on U.S. immigration policy in the era of Donald Trump. I'm Alex Alenikoff, director of the Zolberg Institute on Migration and Mobility at the New School in New York City. And I'm Deb Amos. I'm a correspondent for National Public Radio, and I report on immigration. In this episode, we look at how the Trump administration policies have affected immigrant communities and American cities. First and foremost, there's been a change in who is deported, not just serious criminals, but also people who have committed low-level offenses, often just violations of the immigration law. And that was the case with Pedro Hernandez in 2017. The reality is that this is an awful situation that could have been avoided. The reality is that ICE is tearing apart yet another family needlessly. David Leopold, attorney for the Hernandez Ramirez family, thank you again for talking with me today. Immigrant communities now talk about fear for those who are deported and for those left behind whose lives have been devastated by the loss of a loved one. We first talked with Julia Preston, a contributing writer for The Marshall Project. Julia Preston, thanks so much for being with us today. It's great to be here. Barack Obama earned the nickname Deporter-in-Chief because of the hundreds of thousands of immigrants who were removed from the United States during his presidency. Donald Trump came into office promising to remove millions of immigrants. What have the numbers looked like under Trump? The total numbers of uh, deportations, formal removals under President Trump have never matched the peak years of President Obama. President Obama, in several years, had more than 400,000 formal removals in a single year. President Trump is more in the 350,000 range. Those are not small numbers. What is notable, I think, about President Trump is that at the beginning of his term, issued some executive orders that had the effect of eliminating priorities that President Obama had established at the end of his term. So while the numbers overall for President Trump are not as high, the numbers of people who have no serious criminal record are going up every year. Julia, what do you think accounts for the fact that the Trump numbers were considerably lower than the Obama numbers, given the promises Trump made about the massive removal teams that he would put together to get undocumented immigrants out of the country? I think it's a couple of things. The first is that undocumented immigration from Mexico has dropped dramatically in the last five years. What we're seeing at the border now are asylum seekers, mostly from Central America, but also from other countries. And increasingly, those uh, people are not getting into the country and not being able to settle in the country. The other thing is that the people who are here and who were subject to deportation proceedings very often had very complicated cases. A lot of these uh, immigrants have been here for many years, and they have families. Some of them are married to United States citizens. Those cases were not cases where you could just do what ICE, I think, would like to do, which is just, you know, walk up to the door, demand that this person come out, slap the handcuffs on them and, and march them out of the country. Those options are not available to ICE anymore. At the same time, the Trump administration all often promised a big crackdown. You know, ICE was coming to the cities. It was just a matter of days. They would put out announcements. Was that a demonstration? Was it a kind of deterrence by by fear, by saying that ICE was coming? And sometimes they wouldn't. 
At the beginning of the administration, I think it was just that the president did not understand basic things about due process and about what ICE has to do in order to mount one of these big operations. There was one instance about a year ago where the president made a big announcement, we're going out there, ICE is going to be fanning out across the country. And then nothing happened. I think it was more that the communities, as the Trump administration developed, became acutely aware of the dangers that this administration presented for them. And there is much more organizing, much more mobile phone apps, networks of of information and caution, a lot more training about what to do if Immigration and Customs Enforcement appears in your community or comes to your door. And in that case that I described a year ago, I think the communities just immediately went to ground. People went into hiding. They took all the precautions. And I think ICE realized that if they carried out those raids and operations uh, after the president had announced them in that very flamboyant fashion, that they were just going to run into a lot of trouble and not find a lot of the people that they were looking for. All that being said, I do think that the tone of this administration, the president's rhetoric in terms of describing immigrants in general, and particularly immigrants from Mexico as being rapists and criminals, had a profound effect. People live in fear. Fear is never far away from these families. They talk about the experience of going out of the door every day, going to work or sending their kids to school and never knowing for sure that everyone in the family would be back at home that evening. Julia, you've just completed a report for the Marshall Project called The True Costs of Deportation. Uh, And you look at a number of examples of undocumented migrants with families in the U.S. who were uh, permitted to remain here under the Obama years. But when Trump came in, something different happened. Can you take us through one of those examples? We have the case of Celeste Hernandez. Celeste is an American citizen and she is married to a man named Pedro Hernandez, who's a, uh, a Mexican immigrant. Pedro was extremely important to Celeste's household because Celeste has a severely disabled son who is now 30 years old. And among other things, Celeste can barely lift her son out of his bed to his wheelchair and from the wheelchair back to his bed, which is basically the entire range of movement that this young man has at this point. And so her husband, among all the important things that he did for this household, including being the father to their son, Luis, who's now 11 and is also an American citizen, Pedro helped Celeste with the care of this severely disabled American man. He had had several prior deportations And at one point, ICE tried to uh, send him to federal court and get him convicted of the federal crime of illegal reentry. And I describe in my story the reaction of the federal judge when this family goes into court and Pedro Hernandez is sitting in the defendant's box and this very disabled Uh, son is in his wheelchair. He sees Pedro. He starts calling out. And the judge is uh, made aware for the first time that there's a disabled person that, that Pedro Hernandez is taking care of and basically dismissed the criminal charges on the spot. And so Pedro Hernandez then did everything that he needed to do to become a legal permanent resident as the spouse of a United States citizen. And that process was almost at the end when the Trump administration came in and decided that he was a multiple immigration offender and deported him summarily. They gave him a month, basically, to get out of the country. So now the situation is that this family, both of them were working. They were happy. They were good parents. They were going to church, contributing to their community. Now Celeste is left to try and take care of this 
disabled son by herself. She's entirely dependent now on public services. Her income is zero. She had to quit her own job. They lost Pedro's income. And so in addition to the anguish, you see the incredible financial toll that these deportations take on these families, which are, these are American families. These families are all of, she has four children, all of them are American citizens. Celeste is an American citizen. And yet here is this deportation that just caused this terrible anguish for no really discernible public safety benefit that I could tell. Julia, this is a case where a man marries, he has a child in the United States. As you say, he's done everything right to regularize his status. He was very close to regularizing his status. Why is that not an argument to say, I was soon to be regularized? Why is that not an argument? Because he had prior deportations, he was going to need some kind of a waiver or some kind of dispensation on those deportations so that he could go ahead and complete his uh, green card process. The Obama administration was willing to give him that. And the Trump administration not only was not willing to look at all the contributions that he'd made, his family, none of that was taken into consideration by the Trump administration. It was just, you violated immigration law, we're going to deport you. Your report, Julia, notes that household incomes tend to drop by uh, almost a half uh, following the deportation of a household member. And you also note that there are just about 6 million American citizen children living in households where one of the members uh, is an undocumented migrant. What are some of the general conclusions you draw from your study? We were trying to show, first of all, that the universe of people who could be affected by this, and particularly the universe of American citizen children, is very large. The second thing we were trying to show is just how damaging uh, this kind of deportation can be when you have a, a family that has American children in it, both parents are working, you take out the undocumented breadwinner, and you just, you're facing financial catastrophe. This is family separation, and it's much more permanent and enduring than the family separation that we saw at the border. The impacts of this kind of separation are much more enduring, and they not only affect these families, but they also affect the communities. One of the things that I saw in Painesville, Ohio, where two of the families that I wrote about live, is how demoralizing this was to the whole community. The other thing that I became aware of in the course of doing this reporting is the whole idea of self-deportation. How many people have left because they thought that ICE was actually coming after them, and they realized that if they wanted to have any prospect of living in the United States legally with their children and their families, that they were going to have to leave and try and come back. Of course, the Trump administration would view that as a victory. They say that our policies are working because we're sending people home. Uh, other people are leaving out of fear of being deported themselves, and it saves the U.S. Uh, the, the resources of having to remove someone, and it reduces the undocumented population in the United States. What, what's the answer to that? One of the self-deportations that I write about in my story is the case of a man named Alfredo Ramos, Alfredo had lived in the United States for decades. He had been deported uh, many years ago, but he lived in the United States. He had two U.S. citizen children and was a very uh, hands-on, caring father to these kids. He was a passenger in a vehicle that was stopped in a very minor traffic stop, and he ended up getting into the lights of ICE and He wasn't deported at that time, but when the Trump administration came in, they started to come looking for him. So Alfredo ended up deciding that he wanted to leave for Mexico so that he would have a chance someday, hopefully legally, to come back and be with his kids. About a year after he was living in Leon, Guanajuato, he was gunned down on the street Uh, shot 27 times in a case of mistaken identity. The traffickers left a note indicating that they thought he was somebody else, 
a rival trafficker. And the police determined that it was a case of mistaken identity. So here we we leave two American citizen children. His son, Cristian, is now deployed in a high-risk assignment in the Navy. He enlisted in the Navy. And his daughter is a track star in high school. And, you know, they don't have their father. They miss their father. They, they're they mourning for their father. And what was achieved, what was gained from this, the trauma to the family, the shock to the community, what was achieved? Uh, you know, what was the public safety advantage to this? From the beginning of the Trump campaign, he promised that he would get what he called bad hombres out of the country on day one. We have already seen that the deportation numbers in the Trump administration are, in fact, lower than they were in the Obama administration. By the Trump administration's measures, has their policy been a success? I get the press releases from ICE every day. There are some very bad people, and you know, some of them are Mara Salvatrucha people, there are gangs across the country, drug dealers of one sort or another, and those people, you know, they're closing in on them and they're getting them out of the country. I think you could make a strong argument that maybe that's what I should be doing, is focusing on some of the really uh, dangerous criminals that are in the country. But unfortunately, what they've done is take that you know, relatively small population of dangerous criminals and expand the imagery out to cover virtually all of the immigrants in the United States. So while ICE, I think, has been successful and pretty well focused on confronting some of these gang members and, you know, other people that I think we can all agree we don't want to be in the country, the problem is how this policy has affected so many communities in the country that are just hardworking people that are just trying to make a life in the United States. Julie, what's your your main takeaway from the work you've done in this area? I'm just trying to get people to start thinking about the aftermath of deportation and its public policy consequences in communities uh, across the country. The deportation happens on one day, but the devastating consequences, the anguish, the financial disaster, the trauma for the children, these things are lasting implications. And this is happening on a mass scale. We are in an age of mass deportation from this country. We've heard two stories about deportation and the families left behind. Now we're going to widen the lens to New York City, the leading immigrant city in the country. We speak with Bita Mistofi, Commissioner of the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. Bita Mistofi, thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. You're in touch with many, many people in immigrant communities and immigrant organizations throughout New York. What can you tell us about the impact that the Trump administration policies have had on these communities? I have to pull back and and say a little bit about New York City. You know, we're a city where nearly 40% of our population is foreign born. That's 3.1 million New Yorkers. Significantly in that, there are half a million New Yorkers that are undocumented who are in homes with another half a million. So that means a million people are impacted in a way that's even more significant, meaning that they could lose a loved one, a family member, a parent, a child who is undocumented due to increased enforcement and certainly further isolation due to the fear that the federal rhetoric has had. And I can say that this has been such a difficult time for so many. Uh, Family separation that people have experienced further uh, fear and interacting with government, even local government, increased concern about even participation in your child's school, losing primary breadwinners, just so much added trauma to families, to children. It is very real. You know, I've been in rooms with mothers who have cried because the travel bans are in place and they can't be with their children or loved ones. I've been in rooms with people who have just experienced 
an arrest of a loved one who's undocumented. So there's clearly been an uh, an increase in anti-immigrant rhetoric coming uh, from the White House. Has that been matched on the ground by an increase in enforcement efforts by ICE in New York City? The answer is pretty definitive. You know, in the first year that we did the analysis, the calendar year of 2017, we saw an increase in arrests by about 80% or so. And we have consistently seen those high levels maintained. We've also seen an increase in people placed in removal proceedings. We've also seen a huge spike of about 334% um, of arrests in people who have been long-term residents of our city. And by that, our team has sort of defined it by having lived here for 10 or more years. Of course, these are people who have deep ties in the city, um, either through family, employment, or community, or otherwise. Beyond that, we also have seen impacts on our public services. So our Department of Social Services produced data that demonstrated that since the start of the Trump administration and really threats of enforcement against people who utilize public benefits, we've actually seen a dramatic decline of utilization of food stamp benefits by non-citizens. These are folks who are food stamp eligible, meaning that they are likely legal permanent residents um, and really have less risk of immigration enforcement or deportation. But the the threat, the rhetoric, the fear is so pervasive that even they are retreating into the shadows. How do you convince uh, an immigrant population to continue uh, to cooperate with the, with the city when they see that deportations continue even through this pandemic? How do you convince them that New York will protect them, that you can stand up to the punishments coming from Washington? You know, I certainly firmly believe, and I know that the mayor does, and so many across our administration, that it's about being honest, it's about being consistent, and it's about, you know, your actions. It has been about advancing additional local laws that underscore our intention, like prohibiting the ability for immigration enforcement to conduct enforcement actions on city property without legal authorization. We've invested increasingly in immigration legal defense in a way that is unparalleled in any other locality in this country. We have invested in in rights education. What do you do as communities when there's immigration enforcement? What are your rights? Because you have them. You're protected under the Constitution. That's it for this episode of Entry Denied. Thanks for listening. We'd like to thank Aaron Johnson for production assistance. Sahil Ansari is our producer and engineer, and our music is composed by Eli Alenikov. Check out our show notes on EntryDeniedPodcast.com, and you'll find resources to help you go even deeper into some of the issues. And please subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening to us. And leave us a review as well. We'd love to hear from you. See you next week. Music